Hello everyone. Welcome to Advancements in Treatment for Hemophilia. I'm Brendan Hayes and I'm the Director of Education for Innovative Therapies at NHF. We're very excited to have you join us this evening and you're all in for a treat. A few housekeeping issues. This is a live session. Please add any questions to the chat and Dr. Young will be answering those at the end of the session. And we're gonna to try to get to as many of those as we can, uh, as we have time for. Maria Santaella and James Ueda from NHF are also on the chat and will be helping this evening. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Guy Young, who'll be um, uh, doing the, the session for us this evening. Dr. Young is the director of the Hemostasis and Thrombosis Center at Children's Hospital Los Angeles and a professor of pediatrics at the University of Southern California's Keck School of Medicine. Guy Young received his medical degree from the State University of New York at Stony Brook School of Medicine in Stony Brook, New York. He completed a residency in pediatrics at Schneider Children's Hospital at Long Island Jewish Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, and a fellowship in pediatric hematology oncology at Children's National Medical Center George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, DC. His current research activities encompass clinical trials in hemophilia, the use of novel anticoagulants in children, and the development of the global hemostasis assays to monitor the effects of medications used to treat bleeding and hemophilia. He is the current chair of the Scientific and Standardization Committee on Factor VIII, Factor IX and Rare Bleeding Disorders of the International Society on Thrombosis and Hemostasis, and also serves on the Scientific Subcommittee on Hemostasis for the American Society of Hematology. He's also been awarded the National Hemophilia Foundation Physician of the Year Award in 2013. Welcome, Dr. Young. Well, thank you for that kind introduction and uh, welcome to all of you to the NHF virtual meeting. Um, I think that uh, we obviously would all prefer to be, uh, you know, together in person, but uh, obviously uh, for uh, clear reasons that uh, we cannot, but you know, hopefully next year. In the meantime, hopefully this uh, uh, virtual meeting will work very well for all of you. So I was asked to talk about the advances in the treatment of hemophilia, and this is obviously with a focus on patients. Although uh, patients are so savvy these days that obviously I will be using some of the technical terms that most of you should be familiar with. I wanted to just give kind of a broad overview. I'm not gonna get into very much detail about specific drugs because there's a lot to talk about. Um, I will get into a little bit of data, but not a lot. Mostly it's gonna be sort of a, just a review and an overview with some also philosophical thoughts for you to, to think about. Uh, and I'm speaking directly now to patients and parents of patients, uh, things for you to think about. So uh, with that in mind, um, obviously the treatment options that I'm gonna be discussing will include factor products. Um, those have been available for a long time, non-factor products of which we have one, and then I'll touch upon several others that will be coming available in all likelihood in the coming uh, few years. And then of course, uh, you know, gene therapy, uh, where we may have something available uh, as early as uh, later this year. So I think, you know, the first thing I want you to think about as I go through this discussion is, you know, how do you choose what is right for you or for your child? And I think that people in hemophilia or, or pe people, persons with hemophilia or parents of children with hemophilia, you know, you have to think of yourself uh, into some categories. Now, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive, um, but uh, I want you to think about these as I go through my talk. Are you what I call a factor person? And I hear this, this is one of the things I hear from my patients. I hear patients say, yeah, you know, Dr. Young, factor's been around for a long time. Factor's basically replacing exactly what's missing. And I'm a strong believer that that's the way that hemophilia should be treated. You may fall into that category. You may fall into that category, but you may also be interested in something new that may make things easier for you, in which case we may be talking about you know, things that re relieve you of the treatment burden of factor. When I'll get into the details of the treatment burden as we go through the talk. The other question to ask yourself, particularly if you're older than 18, uh, or for those of you who are parents of children who are, well, maybe will be 18 in the coming two, three, maybe even four years, you can start thinking about this. Are you over 18 years of age and willing to take some long-term risk 
for the opportunity to have a normal factor level without infusing. Of course, here I'm talking about gene therapy, and, and we'll get into whether, you know, a normal factor level is, is uh, truly achievable for everybody and, uh, and some discussion about gene therapy as well. And I know there's a lot of gene therapy discussion at this meeting, uh, so this will be just another, uh, I'm sure you're going to hear lots of bits and pieces to put the puzzle together for you and how you feel about it. So let's talk about these three and, and, and thinking about it this way. I have on the scale there 0, 50, 100, and I'm referring to basically factor levels, although essentially you can think of it as correction of your coagulation defect, 100 being completely normal, 50 being half, 0, of course, not being there. And with factor therapy, we know that one of the issues uh, is that you have peaks and then a trough and then another peak and then a trough and so on and so on. And there may be some advantages to this, and there are clearly some disadvantages to this. The other thought is non-factor therapy, and we're still trying to figure out what non-factor therapy is doing, but we do know, at least with the currently available emicizumab, that essentially you have a steady level. And I painted the steady level here in the mild hemophilia range. You can see that if you draw the lines across, it's roughly 10 to 40. But for any individual patient, they're basically in one of those lines. You're not hovering between 10 and 40. You're following a certain line. And we still have a lot to learn about emicizumab and certainly about drugs that aren't even on the market yet, about you know, whether patients are living like a patient who has mild hemophilia at 10, 30, 40. We really don't understand that fully. Be that as it may, in the future, uh, we may have non-factor therapy products that actually can put your level in the normal range. I think currently we believe emicizumab converts you to a mild hemophilia phenotype, but we may have drugs in the future that may be a non-factor therapy that can really give you essentially a normal-like level, if you, wish, if you will. And that means that you'd be able to do really any and all activities without really having concern or almost no concern for bleeding. With emicizumab, it works really well, uh, but patients do still have bleeding. It's not expected that it's going to be 100% effective in 100% of patients, and we know that. And then lastly, there's gene therapy, and I kind of painted it quite broadly because some gene therapies are getting levels in the 25 to 30% range. Others are trying to get to normal, and I'll show you some data on that. And of course, the goal of gene therapy is to keep your level steady over, over many, many years. Uh, but what we've seen so far, and I'll show you a little bit of data on uh, the valoctocogene uh, roxaparvovec, valrox, um, the product that is the furthest along in its development, that we see levels that are kind of decreasing over time, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that. But this is a way to think about the different therapies, factor peaks and troughs, non-factor steady, but where are you living at? And we don't really quite know. Gene therapy, the prospect to get you to normal and keep you there, although the possibility that factor levels may drop off. So what are the pros and cons of factor therapy? As I mentioned earlier, you're replacing what is missing. We have a long history of use with factor, and even if we just think about recombinant factor, you know, that's going back practically 30 years now. I believe the first one was licensed in 1992, if I remember correctly. They're very safe. I mean, there is a risk for inhibitors, of course, in the previously untreated patients, but if you pass that point and don't develop an inhibitor, you're very unlikely to develop one. Uh, and other than that, they're extremely safe. They don't have other serious uh, side effects. They barely have any other side effects at all. You can get peak levels in the normal range, depending on how you dose the factor. You can give yourself 40 or 50 uh, units per kilo of factor eight, or a little bit higher than that, depending on which product for factor nine, and get yourself into the normal range at the peak time. You, of course, have the option to give extra doses. So let's say you feel like you had a bleed or, well, you know, I think my level is kind of low. I want, I'm going to go play some sports. And you can always have the option to give yourself an extra dose. And of course, it's the same product to treat bleed. So if you have a bleed, you don't have to think, okay, now wait, which product do you use for bleeds and which product do you use for prophylaxis? You can use the same product. The downside, of course, is IV multiple times a week. Even factor nine products generally are at least once a week for most patients. Difficult to adhere to, as we know. Many kids end up needing ports. Uh, factor levels fluctuate, as I show you, and trough levels lead to uh, bleed risk. And I'll discuss a little bit more with some pictures about the treatment burden. Now, in terms of factor products, what do you have available today? Well, we've got plasma-derived products. We've got standard half-life products. So the plasma-derived products are also standard half-life. 
And those two products need to be dosed roughly three to four times a week. So three times a week or every other day. Then there's the extended half-life products. In the, in the red font, I listed some of the main differences. So the plasma-derived products, we have data that suggests that there's a lower risk for the formation of inhibitors based on the SIPIT study. The standard half-life products, again, have been shown to be very safe other than inhibitors and have been around for a very long time. And the extended half-life products offer fewer infusions for similar outcomes of standard half-life factors. And the bottom, I did note that for factor nine, the half-life extension is much better than for factor eight. So what about the treatment burden? I mean, what do I mean by that? And I think you're all living that, but let me show you a few ways to think about it. So this could be a typical prophylaxis schedule in hemophilia A, which would be every other day, which is how I typically prefer to treat. So there's your Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and there's your whole month. Now that's one month, 15 infusions. That's a year. And then you have to keep doing that year after year after year. For factor nine or for extended half-life uh, factor eights, it's twice a week. Well, for the most part, some patients maybe can get to every five days, but essentially you're looking at twice a week infusions for most patients. That's still 104 infusions a year. And even if it's every five days, that's still six infusions a month and 70 plus infusions a year. Of course, parents don't like it and kids tend to hate it, even if they have a port. It's a picture of one of my moms who allows me to use this picture and her son, you can see he's got a port in his upper right chest and she's getting ready to infuse and factor there in the, what looks like the living room. And you can see he's not very pleased about it. And of course, the mom said that was a good day, in fact. And he didn't, she didn't have to chase him around the house. And then once she did his infusion, she has another son with hemophilia and she had to repeat the same thing. If you don't have a central venous line, you can run into this problem. Here's a child who's got three band-aids. You can see there and three bandages. And what, what is striking about this picture is that this was for one infusion. So one of the parents of my patients sent this to me to show me how difficult it was to actually do his infusions without a central venous line. So the treatment burden is significant, time, effort, over and over again, and it's painful and sometimes very difficult to even find the veins if you don't have a port. And the ports, of course, have their own issues to deal with. So can we improve on extended half-life factor eight? So there is a, a novel experimental factor eight which is currently called BIV001. It was developed by BioVeritive. That's why it's got that name. And the idea here is to reduce the treatment burden further by offering a weekly infusion schedule, but at the same time, also to increase the trough levels. And there's been a few uh, abstracts on this. I'll just show you one data from animals just because it's uh, easier uh, to look at in a moment. What is BIV001? So basically it's the factor eight FC molecule and um, probably shouldn't use generic uh, trade names too much, but it, sometimes it's difficult not to do that here. So I'll say that aloctate is essentially the factor eight FC molecule. That's what aloctate looks like exactly there. What they did for BIV001 is added this. This is a, it's called D'D3 prime and essentially decouples factor eight from von Willebrand factor. So von Willebrand factor carries factor eight around the body. And as long as you are coupling factor eight to von Willebrand factor as it's normally naturally occurring, you are limited by extension of the half-life to the half-life of von Willebrand factor, which is about 18 hours. That's why it's no surprise that all four of the factor eight extended half-life products that are commercially available, they extend the half-life more or less the same and they have roughly the same half-life. And that's because of this limitation. What this molecule here is this D prime D3 is it's a piece of von Willebrand factor and it binds to the, this factor eight molecule. And by doing that, it blocks the binding site for von Willebrand factor. So now this factor eight can no longer bind to von, von Willebrand factor. So you, like I said, decoupled or removed that issue of the half-life extension. In addition, they added these two, uh, what looks like these string-like molecules. They're called X10s, X-T-E-N, which is an inert molecule that allows it to stay longer in the circulation. So that's what BIV001 is. Basically, there you have the native von Willebrand factor factor eight complex on the left, showing von Willebrand factor with the D prime D3 component that binds to factor eight, which is the one that's in the A's and the C's. BIV001, as I mentioned, I showed you that structure earlier, sorry. And then uh, what happens is when it gets activated by thrombin, so when you need active factor eight, those X10s and the D prime D3 get cut off. And what you're left with is an activated factor molecule that looks exactly like factor 8 FC, which I mentioned earlier is a loctate and can work to prevent bleeding or treat bleeding. 
This is the data just from animals. There is data in humans now that looks the same, but this figure worked very nice for this. And you can see there's the half-life of factor eight FC, and keep in mind uh, in light blue. And keep in mind that's already an extended half-life factor eight. You see half-life of 13 hours in this particular model in monkeys and humans, you can get up to about 18 hours. And you can see that the BIV001 in the purple is actually twice as long a half-life. And in humans, we've seen a half-life up to 40 hours and even a little bit longer depending on the patient, but essentially allowing you to dose this once per week and maintaining relatively high trough levels. So this is currently in clinical trials, both in adults and in children, and uh, hopefully we'll have some data on that in the not too distant future, and this may become available. I'll show you a timeline later on. That's the only thing that currently I will get into with respect to factor therapy. I will say that, that just for time's sake, I couldn't get into every new product. There are um, other things I'll mention to you later on that revolve around the idea of factor replacement that are even more novel and different. So I'll mention that at the end of the talk. As far as non-factor therapy, these are medications that improve hemostasis, so they help you to make a clot and help you to prevent bleeding without actually replacing the missing factor. So how does this work? Well, here's a coagulation cascade, and I know it's complicated, so you don't need to get into the details. The point I'm making here is that we've got molecules in green that I call substitution therapies and rebalancing agents in red, and we'll talk about those. So emicizumab is a substitution therapy. It's not factor eight, but it works like factor eight, so that's where it fits into the system of making the clot. And then we have these inhibitors. You can see the dashed arrows in, and the bolded, um, um, I think I have them, yeah, I didn't uh, highlight those, but the bolded with the dashed arrows, these are the natural inhibitors to clotting. So these are the molecules like TFPI, antithrombin, and protein C that are there to basically put the brakes on the clotting system so we don't overclot, right? I mean, overclotting is, is not good either. And so that's how that, 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 those um, proteins are there to prevent the body from making too much clot. Now, in hemophilia, you don't make enough clot. So one way to address hemophilia is to essentially remove the breaks. So as the clots are begin, as clotting begins to happen, these breaking mechanisms go into play. But if we can block the breaking mechanism, that should allow clots to form in an improved fashion for patients with hemophilia. And there are blocking agents, or what I call rebalancing agents, and I'll show you what I mean by rebalancing in a moment, but molecules that inhibit antithrombin, so that's called fetusaran. There are several molecules that inhibit tissue factor pathway inhibitor listed there. There are also molecules in development that inhibit activated protein C, as you can see there, and also protein S, which are just in very early stages of development. So those are all the, the inhibitors to, uh, to the inhibitors, so to speak, so removing the breaks from the system. So let's briefly talk about emicizumab. I know you've all heard about this drug. It's been around now for hard to believe almost three years approved for inhibitor patients and almost two years for non-inhibitor patients. So I, I, I'm, I, again, don't have time to get into a lot of the detail, but for those who are not familiar, here's factor 8A. This is activated factor 8. And its job, as you can see there in the red, is factor 9A and in the blue is factor 10. Factor 8A's job is to bring factor 9A and 10 into a close alignment so that you can move uh, the clotting cascade along. Emicizumab is a bispecific antibody, so it's an engineered antibody, and bispecific means that the two arms, or those two, it's like an inverted Y there, those two arms you see, one of them can bind one molecule and the other can bind another one, meaning that's what we mean by bispecific, it has two specificities. So one part grabs factor 9A and the other grabs factor 10, basically brings them into the same proper alignment as activated factor eight or as factor eight can do. And so in this way, uh, the clotting reaction can continue with uh, making a proper blood clot, even in the absence of factor eight, if you have emicizumab. This is the reason why emicizumab also works for inhibitor patients, because patients with inhibitors, um, factor eight, bis the bispecific antibody emicizumab is not factor eight, so the inhibitors to factor eight don't recognize it and it can continue to work. There were four major clinical trials. There's there are actually additional ones in Europe and there are more clinical trials being done now, but they were all called the HAVEN trials, one, two, three, and four. These were for patients 
uh, older than 12 with inhibitors was AVEN1, less than 12 with inhibitors was AVEN2, patients older than 12 without inhibitors was AVEN3, and AVEN4 was with or without inhibitors older than 12 that was looking at every four-week dosing. You see some of the results there. Uh, I will, again, not get into too much detail, but just to show you kind of overall results. What you see here is the percent of patients in these trials that reported no bleeds that needed treatment, so zero treated bleeds. And you can see across the trials, other than HAVEN2, roughly 60%, so more than half the patients during the trial did not have any bleeds, and it didn't matter whether they had an inhibitor or didn't have an inhibitor and whatever dose there of uh, emesizumab they were on. For HAVEN2, which is the pediatric study, you can see that during the trial, 86% had zero bleeds. So you're seeing a very high level of zero bleeds. I can tell you that for factor products, you know, the best you can do usually is about 45, maybe 50%. So this is as good, if not better, than factor products at achieving zero treated bleeds. Another way to look at the data, this is more long-term data, is um, looking here at the annualized bleeding rate, or number of bleeds per year. And what you see here are the uh, weekly, uh, sorry, four periods of time, the first 24 weeks on the study in the yellow bars, the 25th to the 48th week, so the second six months roughly in the blue bars, and then going on to the next uh, period of 24 weeks in the next one. You can see all the trials on the bottom, Haven 1, 2, 3, and 4. And what you notice is that with Haven 1, while the annualized bleeding rate initially was 3.1, as patients stayed on emicizumab over time, the longer they stayed on it, their bleeding rate kept dropping to 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.4. For Haven 2, it started out very low at 0 0.4, but it got down to 0 0.1. 0 0.1 ABR basically means one bleed every 10 years. Um, so it's a really uh, low uh, number of bleeds. Haven 3, again, went from 1.8 to 0 0.2. So what this is all suggesting is the longer patients stay on emicizumab, their outcomes continue to improve, probably because they're having less and less joint disease, uh, also controlling spontaneous bleeding that maybe um, wasn't controlled as well with factor therapy. Okay, so moving to the rebalancing agents. So here's what I mean by rebalancing. As I mentioned earlier, the hemostatic system is in balance. There are procoagulants, so the factors, you can see they're on the left side of this scale. And on the right side, or seesaw, you see the coagulation inhibitors. I already mentioned antithrombin, tissue factor pathway inhibitor, protein C, and protein S. Now, if we're missing factor eight or factor nine or one of the other uh, proteins that are procoagulants, we end up with a bleeding disorder. You see some pictures of my patients there. On the other hand, if we have uh, missing one of the coagulation inhibitors, we can end up with the exact opposite problem of hemophilia. We could have a thrombotic disorder. However, if we can take a little bit off of one side, so if you have hemophilia and you're missing one from one side, and we remove one from the other side, we can perhaps rebalance the scale, balance being balanced, restored with no bleeding and no clotting. But can we get the balance right? And this is the real challenge with these agents. If we have the balance tilted this way, we have poor bleed control, although we may not have any thrombosis. On the other hand, if we have tilt the balance too far the other way, we have good bleed control, but we may have thrombotic events as side effects. Ultimately, we want to get the balance perfectly right. So let me talk briefly about a few of these medications. Fetusarin is currently in clinical trials. This is data from the phase one trial. Fetusaran inhibits antithrombin. So the idea is to lower the antithrombin level. You can see in the boxes in that histogram, as the boxes go from left to right, you see the percentage of lowering of antithrombin, going from a little bit of lowering, less than 25%, all the way to substantial lowering, 75%. And what you notice is the bleeding rates go down. The more you inhibit antithrombin, the more you can uh, reduce the amount of bleeding. In other words, the better rebalancing you're getting. There's the actual numbers there. More recently in the phase two study, which has been published and updated repeatedly, there's some more updates on this that came out just recently uh, that I don't have the slides for, but suffice it to say, here's the bleeding rates in patients without inhibitors. Patients on prophylaxis with factor had an ABR of two, on demand an ABR of 12. Those that went on fetusaran had an ABR of 1.7. So basically fetusaran accomplished in this portion of the study, 
the same thing that factor can accomplish. And it's important to point out that like emicizumab, which as you know is given subcutaneously, um, Pituzaran is given subcutaneously as well, and it is given subcutaneously only once per month. Emicizumab, I neglect to say that before, emicizumab is given subcutaneously once per week or could be every two weeks or every four weeks. So then the subcutaneous route is a lot easier. Pituzaran is once a month subcutaneous. So here's the results in patients with inhibitors. I mean, there is an update uh, where these patients, these 14 with inhibitors have a few bleeds now, but still the annualized bleeding rate is very, very low compared to what they had before. So that's Fetusaran for you. So those are two drugs, emicizumab, subcutaneous, once a week for four weeks, and then either once a week, every two weeks, or every four weeks. Fetusaran, subcutaneous, also once a month. You can quickly start to see how much easier it would be to administer these medications. Other rebalancing agents, um, so here's a long list and I will not get into all this. In fact, I do have a talk on Friday. If you're really interested in these molecules specifically, uh, Friday evening Eastern time or uh, late afternoon Pacific time, um, I am doing a session um, uh, along with Maggie Ragney where we will be presenting uh, uh, this data. So I will present this in much more detail there. So we have anti-tissue factor pathway inhibitor agents. You can see four of them. One of them actually is no longer being developed, the Bayer program, uh, but the other ones are either in phase one trials or marstasumab now in phase three and concizumab also in phase three, although that one had some thrombotic events and has been paused temporarily. These other molecules are in much earlier stages of development, although phase one is started for anti-APC. So I realize I'm throwing a lot of terms at you here, but if you want to learn more about these specific agents, please uh, join the discussion on Friday uh, in the evening where I'll get, get into all the detail of these specific molecules you see in this table, ah, as I mentioned there. So let's move on quickly to gene therapy because I want to make sure I save enough time for, for uh, Q&A. So uh, gene therapy, of course, this is, uh, you know, we think the be all and end all. We want a one-time treatment that can permanently normalize the factor levels. Now, that's asking a lot. I mean, that's what we want, but, um, you know, that's a challenge. Um, when we say permanent, we mean like for life, but is that really going to be the case? Um, we want to get factor levels into the normal range, but there are challenges about even doing that. So keep in mind there's, there's still there's a lot, a lot of research going on in gene therapy, and there's plenty of talks at this meeting on it that'll get into more detail than I will. Um, there is a session Wednesday afternoon I, uh, that happened to be in that session too with Steve Pipe, where we're getting into a lot of the detail about the clinical trial results. So I'm just going to touch on them briefly here. Let's look at hemophilia B first. Now you'll see that this publication is almost three years old now. There was a recent brief update um, at a recent meeting, uh, which again, I didn't have the slides for because it came so fast. Uh, it was just a couple weeks ago. The results uh, uh, that you see here from this study uh, that was published a few years ago show the factor nine activity as a percent of normal. And you can see the patients on the y-axis over time. And I kind of drew a line there. You see that the patients are averaging around 30 to 40% uh, factor nine level. And you can see that that's out a year. We now have uh, more data that shows that these patients are, are able to go out even further uh, maintaining these levels, but we're still waiting to hear more details on the phase three study, which is ongoing. Here you can see the annualized bleeding rate. You see before factor infusion in purple, some of these patients were on demand, by the way, and that's why they have a lot of bleeds and some were on prophylaxis. So you see some zeros in the 32 and the 48. But the bottom line is you can see in the panel on the right, which is after the vector infusion, uh, far, far fewer bleeds. In fact, only one of the patients had needed any factor infusions. Um, and this is the total number of factor infusions. Again, you see some patients on prophylaxis with 100, 150 infusions, others on demand. Uh, but still, when you see after vector infusion, a lot less factor usage, which is the whole point of the gene therapy. Um, another product, this is a product from uh, Unicure, um, and this uh, a product is uh, an AV5 vector. So let me first show you their uh, earlier uh, set of data. This is two cohorts with different doses. Essentially, you see that the levels are stable over three years on the bottom axis. Um, and you can see that the levels for cohort one, the mean is 5.1%, so a little bit on the lower side than what you saw with uh, the other one, and here is 
But what this company did was they took this product that was called AMT060 and they re-engineered it. They re-engineered it by adding something called the Padua variant, which is a highly functional factor nine. So it's a factor nine that basically is six to seven times more potent than natural factor nine. And all the companies now are using this in their factor nine products. So AMT061 is using the Padua variant, but otherwise exactly the same uh, component, the same capsid, the AAV5, that you saw in the previous trial. So far, we just have abstract data on uh, these. Uh, th actually, I think it just got published too, but just three patients in a phase 2B study. And you can see that the levels are much improved from 5%, 7%, up to about, you see one patient with 25 and others up to 50%. I can tell you these levels have stayed steady in the recent abstract they presented that these are out now about a year, showing steady levels of about 30 to 50%. So uh, this is the product, AMT061, that has moved on to a phase three study. That phase three study is going on right now, and there is no data uh, available to discuss for that. Uh, the readout of that data we're hoping will be later this year. And then lastly, for factor nine, another company called Freeline Therapeutics, they developed a different vector called AAVS3, and they feel that that vector is more potent at bringing the gene into the liver. So it's more effective at delivering the gene into the liver than the other vectors. At least that's their, um, uh, that's their, their feeling about it. You can see they also use the Padua mutation. They did present data just a few months ago at the meeting called EHAD, which is a European meeting. Nothing has been formally published. Um, but I can show you one slide, which is this one. Uh, so this is the dose level four. I won't show you the first three dose levels. We're trying to figure out the dose, but it looks like this may end up being um, the dose. It's a bit lower than the doses uh, for the other uh, drugs. You can see it's about 10, uh, 1 times 10 to the 12th. If you take this 9 and just make it a, a 10, that would give you, uh, you can just add a, uh, make that 1 times 10 to the 12th or 10 times 10 to the 11th, which is the same. See, they had just two patients in this cohort because they're still figuring out the dose. And you can see that these patients all got prophylactic um, steroids and tacrolimus to prevent a reaction from the immune system. And what you can see is for these two patients, it's very early, it's only the, the third week, but they have factor levels in the normal range. And so this program is continuing to move forward and eventually we'll get into phase three. So I just wanted to show you basically where we are with hemophilia B gene therapy. Uh, we have the Unicure product, the AMT061, which is the furthest along. Uh, we have uh, Pfizer, which is a little bit further behind. They took the Spark um, uh, program and it's now part of Pfizer. And then we also have this program as well. There are others, but these are the three that are in clinical trials that I'm aware of. Moving to factor eight, um, we have um, a multi-year follow-up of AAV5. Uh, this is the uh, product from Biomarin, um, now called val Val Roxaparvavec. We call it Valrox for short. So what you see here is the factor levels over a period of three years. And what you'll notice, and, and don't worry about the orange versus the green, they're just two different ways of measuring the factor. I will say that going forward, the chromogenic assay, the one in green, is going to be the one that's used. But you'll see that the patients at about six weeks are getting very much into the normal range. You see there's a, while there's a wide variability, you see that in the first year, the patients are largely in the normal range of factor levels. But over time, the levels are dropping. They're dropping fairly slowly, because you can see we're out to week 156 here. Um, that's three years. Again, just recently they presented the four-year data where you see a continued slow but steady decrease at the factor level. Um, so that's one issue we have with uh, this factor eight gene therapy product. It's the only one that has gone this far out. So we don't know if the other factor eight gene therapies that I'll mention briefly in a moment um, will also show the same effect or whether this is something specific about this product. But, uh, you know, if you can maintain a a uh, reasonably normal factor level or even convert to mild hemophilia and have that last you for four years, uh, there's certainly something to be said for that. And I think it's a quite a monumental achievement that we have patients now four years out who have not had to use any factor and are not bleeding. Here's what, here's the data on the bleeding rates. Um, you can see the bleeding rate before infusion, the ABR was 16. And you see one year, two year, and three years after the infusion, sorry, you see that the bleeding is, is close to zero. And most of the, this is the annualized bleeding rate um, 
and you can see that the mean is very, very low. And most of these patients are having no bleeds at all. You see the factor usage on the right panel, and you can see, of course, they're not using any factor. They're, well, they're using very little factor compared to what they were using before. So 96% reduction in bleeding, 96% reduction in factor usage, many of the patients not bleeding at all and not using any factor. And again, this is over a period of, in this trial was, in this study was three years, but the four-year data looks very similar. So another product, SPK8011, um, this uh, looking at phase one, two data, again, it's a little bit old. Uh, you can see it's almost three years old. There was a brief update, uh, very limited data um, that was presented at ISTH a couple of weeks ago. Basically what you see here is the factor levels and see this is hovering a little bit lower, but notice the doses are also lower. There's lots of different doses. I wouldn't take this to mean that like this product is inferior to the other product, I think what you need to know is that this product is really still in development. They're still trying to figure out what is the best dose for this product. And should we use preventative steroids, for example, because some of the patients here developed an immune response that ended up losing uh, the factor eight level or the factor eight level drop. So, you know, when you see phase one, two, what that tells you is that the company's developing this, they're still figuring things out before they move to the large scale phase three study. What you saw in the previous panel was also phase one, two, but the phase three data is looking quite uh, similar. So yeah, let me just make sure that I inform you that this data I showed you here, this is also phase one uh, data. Um, but the phase three data, which we just have a preliminary picture of, is showing uh, somewhat lower factor levels, but basically similar outcomes. And then lastly, uh, I'll show you just briefly, this is from Sangamo, uh, and now that's been taken over also by Pfizer for hemophilia A. Uh, again, there was, there was a recent update at ISTH, but again, it's just a couple of weeks ago, so I couldn't update the slides quickly enough. Things are changing so rapidly, it's hard to even keep up with the slides. But here you see uh, uh, two patients out about six months in the normal range, a couple more that are coming up, and they presented data showing that essentially these patients so far are following a similar pattern to what we saw uh, with the patients uh, for Valrox. Although again, this data is far less mature. It's only about one year, um, one year, one and a half years out for very few numbers of patients. So still have to wait to see what we're going to see from the SPK, the Spark data, and this, the Sangamo data. So to summarize gene therapy, let's just put it this way. There are multiple gene therapy clinical trials underway. All of these trials that are in the clinic right now are using the uh, AAV platform, so adeno-associated adeno virus. But I will tell you that's not the only platforms that are being looked at. There are preclinical studies and soon-to-be studies in humans looking at other vectors, such as lentiviruses, which um, have some advantages and some potential disadvantages. Even non-viral gene transfer, there's companies looking at getting the DNA into your body without using a virus at all. And then in addition to that, gene editing technology, which is basically going in and snipping out one gene and replacing it with another gene. And then lastly, I did mention that one product, Roxaparvivac, Val, uh, I have it backwards there, Valoptocogene Roxaparvivac uh, may be available as early as later this year in the United States. There's a lot of unknowns with gene therapy. Um, we have issues of immune reactions, the durability question mark. I mentioned earlier, only one product is really out long enough for us to make any assessment on that. Um, will that be different for factor eight and factor nine, for example? We don't know. There are issues, concerns about long-term toxicity, which of course we can't answer until we have it more in the long term. Cost and access, implementation, it's not going to be that easy, uh, like implementing a new medication like emicizumab or a new factor product into your center. There's a lot that goes into having gene therapy available. And then of course, use in young children, because all of these have been only studied in adults. If you're interested in sort of the, the knowns and the unknowns, this is a really, really nice uh, discussion uh, from Glenn Pierce and Alfonso Iorio, which was published in the journal Hemophilia uh, uh, about two years ago. It really talks about the knowns, uh, known knowns and known unknowns and unknown unknowns, all these uh, aspects of gene therapy. So I suggest that if you're really interested to read that, so you get a sense of, you know, what, what are the things that we know and what are the things that we really don't know or things that we don't know we know or things that we don't even know we know. And again, that's very confusing, I know, but uh, they explain it very well in the paper uh, what these categories are. So I'm gonna close uh, with a few slides about some other future therapies and that should leave us with uh, some time.
time for questions. So for hemophilia A, um, we have the factor-based therapies. I already mentioned BIB001. I kind of call that extended half-life version 2.0, if you will, EHL 2.0. It's taking the extended half-life concept of factor eight and taking it to another level. What I didn't mention are these products here. Octo101 is a subcutaneously delivered factor eight. So it's actually factor eight, it's not like emicizumab, but it's delivered subcutaneously. Another one is aiming to deliver the factor eight via implanted spheres. So they're these like essentially tiny spheres you can think about, and they, these are biospheres. So they put factor eight inside uh, the, the spheres or not really factor eight, they make cells that go in there, cells that can make factor eight and they implant them in the abdomen and then the cells produce the factor eight and then it's released into the tissue. And then there's also even a pill form of factor eight that was, at least I heard about a year ago, I haven't heard much of it since then. So for these three clinical trials, as far as I'm aware, have not begun yet unlike for BIB001 where we do have clinical trials. So you may have other options besides even the ones I already mentioned to deliver factor eight in different ways, subcutaneously via these implanted spheres or orally. Then the non-factor products, I touched on most of these already. The only one I didn't touch on was something called Mimate. This is a essentially a bispecific antibody like emicizumab that's aiming to be uh, uh, you know, a challenger, if you will, or aiming to be a quote-unquote version 2.0 or next generation of a bispecific antibody. And it's just about to start human clinical trials. And then lastly, gene therapy. I did mention the three that are listed there, but of course there are plenty of others uh, that uh, I don't have time to mention. I did mention the three that we have the most data on. A couple of caveats, which is that uh, uh, there will be gene therapy programs for inhibitor patients. So far, these programs have only been for non-inhibitor patients. And as far as children, for the foreseeable future, I don't see that these will be available for children, although we are discussing doing these in clinical trials for children at some point in the future. But there's a lot that needs to be worked out, in my opinion, before that's a possibility. Hemophilia B, um, there is a subcutaneous factor nine called dalsinonococ alpha that is already in clinical trials. And then the implanted spheres and the pill that I mentioned earlier are being looked at uh, for clinical trials uh, that are aiming to start at some point in the future. Although again, I haven't heard much about the pill for the past year, although I have heard about the sphere. So I'm not sure if that program is ongoing or to what, what stage that might be. Now, a lot of this stuff is kind of kept uh, a little bit more uh, on the quiet side until they're ready to give us more information. Hemophilia B, again, the same products I mentioned for hemophilia A for non-factor other than emicizumab, which only works for hemophilia A. And then gene therapy, I did mention, yeah, there you have the long name. So AMT061 that I mentioned earlier, that's the one on the top there, Entronacogene Desaparvivec, and the uh, uh, Pfizer product or the, that was called Spark, Spark's product is now called Fidenacogene uh, Elaparvivec. Uh, and L, uh, the Freeline product is LFT188, doesn't have a, a, a more complicated name. These names are kind of hard to say. So la this is the last slide that'll give us about 15 minutes for questions. I put on the I put a timeline here. On the top, I put what I call temporary corrective agents. So these are things that you have to just keep giving over and over again, right? They, they'll correct things only temporarily. On the bottom, I said permanent. Now, when I say permanent, take the word permanent with a grain of salt, because I already showed you that for one product anyway, um, we have a, a decreasing um, uh, levels over time. So how permanent these will be, you know, remains to be seen. So you see in 2019, right now you have standard half-life factors, extended half-life factors, and emicizumab available. <clears throat> in 2020, it's likely that we'll have, um, gosh, I need to fix that, but, uh, oops, I lost the screen share. I apologize. Let me get back to that. Um, I don't know why that happened. Okay, share screen. This one. Okay. Um, and you can see here, um, uh, that spelt a little wrong, I had to change that to a, a C, sorry about that. But in 2020, we probably will have, we don't know yet, but Valoctocogene, Roxoparvivec. Uh, and then you see the other gene therapies. And, and by the way, this timeline, uh, please don't quote me on this. Um, these are, you know, my 
general estimates. And I think the only thing we know for sure is what's available now. Even this Valoctocogene Roxaparvo Act for 2020, until the FDA makes its ruling, uh, we won't know 100% for sure if it's approved. And for everything 2021 and beyond, please take these timelines with a grain of salt. These are just my you know, estimates from things that I've heard at meetings and uh, things that I may have heard from the company. So none of that is set in stone. You know? So whether Fetuzaran will actually be available in 2021 is, um, I think that's what we hope, but we're not sure yet. And these other uh, compounds for 2021, such as the other factor nine gene therapy, I think that's still all up in the air. So please, again, when you look at this timeline, uh, don't say Dr. Young said <laughs> that this drug will be available in 2021 or 2023. Uh, those are educated guesses on my part. Um, and so um, I'm going to stop um, and uh, get to my last slide. And I know it's a, a whirlwind tour, and you know, hopefully things are as clear as uh, what you see in this picture. So I'm going to pass it back to uh, our moderators, uh, Brendan and and Maria, and I'm happy to take your questions. Looks like we have about 14 minutes for that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for this amazing presentation, Dr. Young. I, I think I, I remember clearly when it was so easy to make a decision about factor treatments. Um, so I, the first question in the chat was about uh, emicizumab in the use, the use of emicizumab um, on patients who have been previously tolerized of their inhibitors. And, they wanted to know if there was any data about that. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So if you've been tolerized of your inhibitor, what we've always done is put patients on factor VIII prophylaxis because, well, we wanted to continue to prevent bleeding. And the question was always, you know, is that factor VIII that we're giving on a regular schedule, is it, in fact, also maintaining the tolerance? What I'll tell you is that, you know, there really is no data on that. There's, there's one retrospective study, so it's got a lot of limitations. Um, that study actually suggested, if anything, that you don't need to continue factor VIII prophylaxis because it showed that the patients who dropped their factor VIII didn't have the inhibitor come back more than the patients that continued the factor VIII. But that's just a small retrospective study, and I think we need real data on that. And I'm happy to say, actually, that we are starting a study called the Priority Study, this is going to be a study that at the end of successful immune tolerance, patients will be randomized to emicizumab plus factor VIII weekly to try to maintain tolerance versus emicizumab alone, because maybe we don't even need to continue any factor VIII. And until we have the results of that study, which probably will take two to three years, we won't really know what to do. And so for those who are asking that question for today, you know, my, my son was tolerized and do I need to continue factor eight in some way, shape, or form? Unfortunately, the answer is we don't really know what we should do. Can we just cut the factor eight off altogether and go on emicizumab? Do we have to continue factor eight for some length of time and eventually can switch to emicizumab? Um, or, can we all, or do we always have to maintain factor eight? And, and, and unfortunately, until we complete this study that I mentioned, we won't really have an answer. So, you need to discuss the pros and cons of continuing factor eight versus discontinuing factor eight and using emicizumab or one of these other new drugs with your you know, HTC physicians and nurse practitioners and nurses. Um, and you'll have to make a decision just based on the fact that we don't have enough evidence to make an evidence-based decision. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and the other question is about emicizumab also. Um, you know, they're wondering, they understand that it's an antibody, but what are the chances of the body uh, have of making an antibody to the bispecific antibody and then nullifying its advantage? Yes, that's a really good question. In the HAVEN uh, studies, there were three patients uh, that developed antibodies that actually neutralized or interfered with emicizumab. One was an adult patient who eventually, um, for uh, personal reasons, dropped out of the study. Didn't drop out because the emicizumab wasn't working for him, but dropped out of the study. The other two were pediatric patients. One of them, the antibody eventually went away. The patient had no bleeding. And in fact, if that patient was in the clinical setting, like you're watching that, but you wouldn't know because the patient had no bleeding symptoms. So you wouldn't know he even developed an antibody. One patient did develop an antibody that completely blocked the effect of emicizumab, and he had to come off the study. 
Since then, uh, there is a publication actually that uh, I worked on with a group uh, of physicians from Virginia, where they identified another patient who did, who seemed like they had an antibody to emicizumab, and in fact, um, we did the testing in my lab and identified that he did have an antibody to emicizumab. So that's the second one. And then in the grapevine, I heard that there was a third patient in France, although nothing has been published. So it seems that, so there's three patients uh, probably that we have seen that clearly have these strong antibodies that block the effect of emicizumab. It is estimated, and this is coming from Roche and Genentech based on you know, internal data they have, that about 8,000 patients now have received emicizumab. So as you can see, that's a very, very small risk. I mean, compared to factor VIII inhibitors, it's much, much smaller. So I'll just basically say that, is it possible to get an antibody against emicizumab that blocks its effect? Yes, because it's happened. However, it seems like it's quite rare. Your physicians uh, should monitor you once you switch from factor VIII to emicizumab. Um, really, the drug is very effective, so there shouldn't be obvious bleeding symptoms. The way that we knew that these patients, at least the two that I'm aware of, one on Haven 2 and the other patient from Virginia that we studied, these patients, after completing their loading doses, so after the first month, started to have bleeding symptoms that were really like as if they weren't getting treated, like a regular inhibitor patient. Bleeds in their arms, bleeds in their ankles, a lot of bruising. It was kind of obvious that the emicizumab wasn't really working. And it, both, for both patients, it happened very quickly, within five to six weeks after starting emicizumab, it was noted that they were having these bleeding events that were not happening in the other patients. So if you are going to switch to emicizumab or you're on emicizumab, I would say the likelihood of getting an antibody is low. And if it's going to happen, the way we've seen it, at least for these two patients, is it happens pretty quick, within four to six weeks. Let your doctors know, I'm having my son or I am having a lot of bruising or bleeding symptoms. They can do some testing in their lab based on the papers that have been written, the one we recently wrote, on how they can try to identify the antibody in that patient. Okay, thank you. That was a very good, good response, very thorough. All right, the next question has to do about um, AAV5. And this person wants to know, can you please touch on other vectors beside that one um, for those of us who will have antibodies against AAV5? Sure. So we're looking at lots of AAV vectors. I actually, um, just because of the way the slides were set up, and I apologize, I should have tried to be a little bit more clear about that. But there were um, the, other a the other vectors that are being looked at include AAV2, AAV6, AAV8. And in fact, others that, that don't match exactly like a naturally occurring. So when we say AV2, 5, 6, 8, it means that that vector is structured like a naturally occurring AV. Now, these are, of course, all made in a lab. Nobody's giving you any live virus or anything. These are all made in a laboratory, but they're structured like, like the naturally occurring viruses. But, for, but some of the companies have decided, no, we're going to just, we're going to play around with the DNA. We're going to make an AV that is going to have the properties that we want to have, even if it's not a naturally occurring AAV. So the point I'm making is there's lots and lots of different AAVs out there. As I mentioned, the one from Freeline, for example, is called AVS3. Uh, Sparks are proprietary. They're called SPK9001, uh, 8011, and they have others. So, uh, you know, the answer really is that there are a lot of different AAVs being developed. Now, as far as pre-existing antibodies, um, we're still learning about this. We know patients can have a pre-existing antibody against one vector and not another. So some patients may be eligible to receive a gene therapy or may not be eligible to receive one gene therapy, but may be eligible to receive another gene therapy. Um, so yes, those are things that if you're interested in a gene therapy trial, but you didn't qualify for one because of a pre-existing antibody, you should look into uh, a, uh, you know, another trial that is using a, a different AV vector, and hopefully you won't be immune to that one or have a pre-existing antibody say to that one. Okay. Thank you. The next question is, um, this person wanted to know how the ABRs um, are calculated. Is it strictly based on a medically confirmed bleeding episode or is it a compilation based on patient surveys, um, ultrasound? They ask because on many occasions what I perceived as being a bleed um, might not have been one. Yeah. So, you know, this is, uh, this is the real bugaboo of, of doing hemophilia clinical trials is we just don't have a great objective endpoint. So 
just to give you an example of trials where there really it where there's a really perfect endpoint is diabetes right diabetes you can measure your sugar and you you get a number you know whatever your sugar is and then you can monitor with another test called hemoglobin a1c how well your sugar is controlled over time and those numbers are very meaningful and you have an objective raw number in hemophilia we've relied on bleeds now bleeds you can get a number but yes bleeds can be subjective uh, what somebody may perceive as a bleed may not actually have been a bleed. It may have been their arthritis acting up or their, you know, for in, in the joint that has had bleeds before. But unfortunately, we don't really have a better measure right now. We, we all talk about the annualized bleeding rate being not a great measuring stick, but we don't have a better one for most of these clinical trials. Now, for gene therapy, we do have um, you know, two other good measuring sticks. One is the factor level, right? We can tell a patient after gene therapy, every patient has their factor levels measured, and we can say, well, your factor level is 20, or 50, or 80, or 100, and we know what that means. So the factor levels are very important in the gene therapy trials. The other thing in the gene therapy trials is as all the phase three trials require patients to come in already on prophylaxis. So we can see how much factor they're using, Typically, whatever, 104 doses a year if you're on extended half-life, 156 if you're doing it three times a week. And then we can see how much factor is being used after. And that's a good measure as well because that's, that's something objective, right? You, you have a diary you're recording in these trials exactly how many doses of factor you gave. Then you get the gene therapy product, and you also record how many doses you gave. And you can see you know, the big differences that I showed you earlier. But we are still looking at bleeding rates, and so for non-gene therapy trials, unfortunately, that's still the best measure we have, uh, flawed though it may be. <laughs> yes, indeed. So I, you know, there's another person that asked specifically about ultrasound. So I think that you're you you yeah. very clearly answer that that's not being used in clinical trials right now. Yeah. So well, so yeah, yeah. In general, it's not being used in clinical trials. Unfortunately, musculoskeletal ultrasound is not available in many centers, and and uh, even where it is available, I think there's still, you know, it, it 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 has subjectivity too, right? You have to have a very good operator, the person who's actually doing the ultrasound really needs to know what they're looking at. Um, so there's subjectivity there um, as well. It's not like, you know, 100% perfect that you can just put something on the joint and it says, yeah, huh, that joint is definitely bleeding and this joint is definitely not bleeding. But yeah, on the ultrasound is, is useful, but it's not being used broadly in clinical trials. Okay, great. Um, and I think, um, you know, you can be as, as short as you want with this one. There's a, a person in the audience who has factor 13, and they wanted to know if there was any new medication sure. for them in the pipeline. I know that you didn't prepare for that, so I'm kind of putting you in the spot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, we have a plasma-derived and a recombinant factor 13 on the market. Um, and those are, you know, the half-life is so long, they all have to be given once a month, roughly. So it's not quite as hard to do as factor, but there's still the peaks and troughs. Uh, factor 13 is pretty tricky. Uh, I mean, it, it, the way it works, it's kind of coming in after you started to make a clot, and it really solidifies the clot. So whether some of these drugs like Fetusaran, for example, which while it's being aimed at hemophilia A and B, probably will work for deficiencies such as factor 10, factor 7, which are also uh, bleeding disorders. Not so sure that it's going to work for factor 13, to be honest, because factor 13 is really playing a role after thrombin is generated. Um, and so that's the long answer. The short answer is I'm not aware of anything being developed for factor 13. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Young. That was an amazing um, Q&A session. I'm going to um, send it back to Brendan that she'll close the session for us. Thanks again, everyone. Great. Um, Dr. Young, I just wanted to let you know, I wanted to start with letting you know that um, we've got a, a live chat going and you are getting tons of kudos and thank you. Okay. So I just wanted to make sure that you knew about that. So I um, wanted to just give you one more question. Um, there are so many choices. I mean, your whole presentation was about how many different options um, that we have now and in the future and will have in the future. Do you have any advice for patients who are trying to determine or you know, make decisions on their treatment options for the near future? Any advice? Yeah, the main advice is really get yourself uh, as educated as you can. And, and obviously you're on this session here and participating in HF to learn. I think, um, so, so learn as much as you can about what's available. 
I think the other advice is ask yourself kind of what kind of philosophy you have. And I opened with that slide at the beginning to paint the picture um, because I've heard from people who say, no, I really, I'm going to stick with factor. I don't want emesizumab and I'm not interested in gene therapy. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if, if that's your philosophy, learn about what factor products may become, what, what is available, what may become available. Um, what is your appetite for, for risk, for example? Some people, they, they, they have a very low, uh, they're, they're very risk averse. They don't want to really take too many risks. Well, factor products have been around for decades and they're safe. And if it works for you, you know, that's the lowest risk approach you have. On the other hand, some people might think, no, I, I don't mind taking some risk. If you're willing to take some risk, you have the opportunity to be to receive a, a gene therapy product, for example, that can put your factor level in the normal range and keep you there. And then you can go mountain biking and skiing and not even worry about it. My patients, you know, they go skiing and they're so scared that half the time of the parents, they're so anxious, they can't even enjoy the weekend of skiing because they're just worried that their kids are going to have an injury and, and end up having a bad bleed. Well, how would you like to be freed from worrying about hemophilia, having a normal factor level? You can do whatever you want. You don't need to worry. Well, if that's something you really want and you can accept some risk, right? You'd have to have some um, ability to take on some risk because we don't have the long-term knowledge. Then that is then, then, then that could be an option um, for you. So, so think about your appetite for risk. Think about if you're a factor person or you know, somebody who's willing to try different things to make things easier. And I think those are the, the best advice I can give. Learn, learn about what's available and learn about yourself and how you feel about these kind of things. Fantastic. Again, I can't thank you enough. We're um, so excited that you were able to be here tonight. For everyone else that, um, in the audience, thank you guys for being here too. We really appreciate it. You're going to be receiving an evaluation in, the, in the email tomorrow, and we would really appreciate you completing that. Remember that attendees can receive the conference bag and all the goodies sent to your home if you're among the first 500 individuals to complete 10 session evals and visit eight booths, and this is for U.S. residents only. If you'd like more information about gene and innovative therapies or bleeding disorders in general, I want to, um, you know, encourage you guys to visit the virtual NHF booth. Again, thanks so much for attending, and we hope that you enjoy this week of outstanding programming. Thank you. Thanks, bye everybody.